Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show episode number 489 with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. This is the Agassino Zynga Show episode number 489. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will help the show to go a long way. Do that for me. It'll take you five seconds and I'll greatly, greatly appreciate it. And support, support, support via Patreon. It's also more than welcome. You get one bonus episode per week available through by Patreon only. You can find a description or the link actually to the page in my description. It'll be in the show notes of the show on YouTube and also in the description page of whatever podcast app you're listening to the show on. So make sure you get on there and don't delay. It's only a quid. It's only one pound, one euro. Get involved, one dollar. Support the kid and you get some bonus content of available on patreon only whoopity whoopity do how's it going how's it feeling this is now what monday sometime in the evening i'm recording this hopefully you are doing fine i've just about recovered from a pretty extensive weekend of partying and traveling and standing up and having asinine conversations with strangers in the dance floor you know many toilet visits many bar visits and all that malarkey and i've just about recovered so i'm feeling good feeling brave it's a bank holiday Monday here in the UK, which effectively means it gives most of us kind of, you know, um, you know, in denial, drug addicts and alcoholics an opportunity to go out and basically party with no basically um, excuses and no guilt because then you can basically recover for Sunday and the Monday. So usually people do that. They tend to usually go out on the Saturday for the most part, leave the Friday to chill, hang out with work colleagues, maybe see some family and whatnot, and then go out a little bit crazy on a Saturday for the most part. So the the kind of traffic around the London in general around the weekend was definitely up because of the bank holiday. And usually, you know, there's lots of fun activities to do for families and whatnot, young kids. So it's a great opportunity to go out and enjoy all the pleasures of London. And obviously with COVID, there's, um, there's not as many tourists as around as there was, you know, previously. So it's definitely a lot better to kind of travel around and rummage and have a little bit of a loiter. You don't feel like you're being rushed off your feet everywhere you go. So that definitely opened up things for everybody. But um, it was a little bit of a culture shock. Not culture shock. It was, it did get, it did get, it did take, it did get, it did take some getting used to queuing outdoors, having to show your ID, do the whole vaccine passport thing with your passport itself. Um, it takes a lot, Jeremy. I mean, there's a lot of preparation that has to go into for you to go out now. You, whether it's a piece, whether it's a lateral protest, or remembering to log into your NHS app to show your COVID passport, or any other, you know, um, fugazi documents you've got, you have to kind of keep that in mind. You can't just pop into clubs as you did previously. So that's a little bit of a change. And then once you're in there, for the most part, what I recognise, especially, you know from being out of the club for what the best part of an, um, a year and a half I didn't really go to any illegal parties during lockdown I didn't you know I wasn't really interested at that time it didn't really feel like a, the appropriate time to do that kind of thing and I just wasn't in the mood really I didn't have any other you know big um, grand ideas or ideology as to why I didn't go I just wasn't really in the mood so I hadn't been in a rave proper one for a year and a half don't get me wrong I did the old pirate studios thing here and there had a little bit of a boogie you know got a bit drunk in whatever in a room playing music to myself but it's not the same as being in a party I mean, the ambience of people, that collective sort of energy, electricity is something that you can't really replicate when you're just in Pirate Studio sat in there mixing for a couple of hours. It's not the same. So it took some getting used to. You had to kind of acclimatize to the arena and the space and the people. You had to get used to everyone being next to you. But I have to be honest, after an hour and a half, it did feel quite normal. It did feel just about right. It didn't make a lot of sense. And it really pales in significance. Not, not pale significance, but there is no real comparing going out properly and watching a stream, right? No matter how many times you see one and no matter how, many, how much they try to make it interactive, whether it's you wearing a headset or, you know, you know I don't know, putting on flipping you know blackout shades i don't know whatever you do to kind of get yourself locked in it just doesn't replicate being inside of a place no matter what you're on even if you're just drunk and you even if you're not drunk and you're just in there sober there's no re real replication of that i think the same way as there's no replicating a live gig performance right you have to kind of be there to kind of make it make sense and that was definitely what i experienced over the weekend so i'll kind of touch on that later on um and then what else happened obviously united played wolves away that was a pretty interesting game i'll touch upon that a little bit and a few other bits and bobs at the jake paul and tyron woodley fight happened over the weekend which you know disappointingly enough if you're one of the jake paul and logan paul haters unfortunately tyron woodley did not win but apart from that a fairly quiet weekend for the most part um 
things have been moving at a snail's pace for the most part. It feels like in August, things kind of slow down in general. It's usually one of the kind of longer, longer, it's kind of the, a slightly longer month, right? It doesn't feel like it should be, but it just kind of keeps going. Every time we look next week, it's like another August, another August, another day in August. Like, when would this flipping month end? Um, but you know, it's slowly winding down. The weather started to get a little bit more brisk, a little bit more cold. Um, you can't really wear just t-shirts and shorts everywhere. You have to kind of have a little bit of a hoodie on or maybe a little bomber jacket in your backpack. So the weather's getting a bit dark. No, it's getting a bit dark. The weather's getting a bit colder. And usually this is when I come into my own. This is when I usually come alive when it starts to get dark and I can wear all my big menacing black jackets and big thick shoes and all that nonsense in it. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm not going to lie. I'm looking forward to it. But anyway, jam pack show for you today loads of stuff to get into so make sure you grab yourself a drink and all that good stuff and we're gonna dive 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 on in first thing to talk about actually just because i've just only finished listening to it properly today the finished version is kanye finally dropped his much anticipated album donda right um you know the whole shebang behind it you know all the emotions and all the you know will he or won't he that went into the album and the ideas and the beefs and all that jack shit yeah you know you know the deal you know the deal but let's just talk about it musically for one moment right how good this is and this is coming from somebody that kind of tuned out from all things Kanye related when it comes to music just about let me say around St. Pablo era it's not St. Pablo era when you drop St. Pablo that's when I kind of just you know I kind of thought you know what maybe he's just lost it it just is what it is it's hard for an artist of his caliber especially considering the kind of music that he's done the influence that he's had the fact that he's so successful outside of music and it's incredibly rich as well it kind of takes away the onus and maybe the hunger to go back into a studio and be there until 5am working on the hook or working on a bridge right it's not just not the same at all. it's not going to be the same which i completely understand but as a fan of him and knowing how musically talented he is and you know having listened to some of his best work it's just hard to listen to saint pablo and pretend it's anywhere near any of his best work it's just not it just is the case so i kind of i kind of stopped listening to it from there i, I peaked at you know yay when that came out of course and that was complete garbage i thought from front to back hardly anyone really replayed it if anything the best kind of album to come out of that Kanye period when he was you know um, running around being Trump's, uh, Trump's uh, cheerleader and talking about him being a dad to him was maybe the the kind of Sunday service tunes that's the Sunday service album that was really good I thought as for a gospel album or for a live album it was epically done unfortunately you know there's a lot of stuff surrounding the album with people from the choir saying they haven't been paid and all that stuff but for just in terms of music in terms of arrangement in terms of emotion in terms of layers textures all that stuff that Sunday service album was really 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 good but i have to be honest this donda album might be the best album he's dropped since my beautiful dark twisted fantasy it really is up there i don't care what anyone says i think i've heard a clip recently of charlamagne and god and a few other people from the breakfast club talking about how crap this is and it's too long i don't care i think people's attention span needs to be um worked on anyway i think people are too quick to say something is trash without actually giving it a good listen um an hour and 40 minutes isn't that much i think people spend about that maybe more you know browsing instagram and jumping from page to page and going on Twitter and whatnot and if you can't sit there and passively listen to a music um, an album in the background whilst you're on Instagram or Twitter there's something wrong with you especially how most pages you can just you know make sure the sound is off it's not difficult just listen to it all the way through from the beginning to the front don't get me wrong maybe some of the two songs towards the end could kind of get chopped off but I think overall as a entire project it's really really good like no one can deny the opening track I think especially if you listen to because I was one of the rare people or one of the small amounts niche people big fans who um went out of his way to record the stream and then kind of clip it into guy raj band and then export that into itunes and import that into my phone loads of loads of madness until i obviously found a good copy but i did that stuff and i think a lot of people did and to be honest for a lot for a performance that was um streamed live on apple um music and for something that kind of fed through i don't know whether it fed through one board or how they did it whatever they did in the background it did really sound it did it did sound pretty good when you just listen to the recording of the live performance it sounded like you could got an idea of what the album was going to sound like and feel like but now that it's been mixed and mastered this sounds epic like really really good obviously the one um omission that i'm a bit disappointed with is there's no chris brown in um what track is it i think he actually complained about it online too chris brown isn't featured in uh what's the song here i can't see it 
New Again. Yeah, New Again. That's that song, right? Um, he sounded really good on that. So it's a shame that he's not featured on that. Who knows if that's a Jay-Z thing? We don't really know. But um, he's not on there. But apart from that, the features are incredible. Like, really, really good. Five Year Foreign, of course, maybe have the best verse, I think, overall on um, Off Grid. Um, definitely. I think uh, Playboy Carter, his voice is just, just, you know, he didn't really step up, I don't think, in that regard. But, you know, maybe that's not really his forte. And he seems to be a little bit tight when it comes to features. He just gives people a 16 and bounces. But for Off The Grid was amazing. It's a great entry track. It's a, It's interesting because off the grid or five year foreign in general he's not a he's not like a new artist right he's been around for a while but it's stranger in the in an artist's career sometimes all it takes is one feature all it takes is one track one appearance for your career to suddenly pop again and this might be his reintroduction once again for him to kind of gather some steam and blow up and maybe um, become the star that a lot of people kind of want him to be but he hasn't necessarily been that guy at the moment obviously maybe some legal stuff was happening but i think this might be a chance for him to kind of elevate his career onwards because that verse was just epic like hopefully they, they released a uncensored version because you know it sounds a little bit you know a little bit you know weird but apart from that amazing obviously hurricane fit and reaching little baby on the weekend is just heavenly the weekend on that hook and that chorus like wow 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 um baby keem obviously rips it on praise to god little dirk and vora is all right um i thought little yeah did really well on okay okay he's got that kind of minnesota beat flow that he's kind of rapping with at the moment um, Young Fog of Remote Control it might be one of my favorite tracks on there, especially to play out. I think that'll be a, definitely a good one. I'll get the rave going. Um, what else did I really, really like? Oh, no, let's go back to the verses. So, uh, Five Year Foreign for sure had one of the best verses on there. And then the second one is definitely a controversial choice because of all the cancellation stuff around him was definitely The Baby. I thought The Baby's verse on um, Jail 2 was incredible. Um, definitely a great way to kind of reintroduce yourself um, into the public consciousness after you know all the cancellation stuff that happened with his comments uh, um, what was it was it a rolling loud or whatever right when you made those um, egregious comments that he's still kind of suffering from but I thought that was a really 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 great verse especially for somebody who's uh, especially for an artist who people are accused for being a little bit one dimensional and not having a lot of flows um, I thought he was really good on that one um, I also thought the addition of Marilyn Manson you know again just as a layer on top on that chorus was incredible like who's going to jail tonight screaming in the background you're like oof that sounds phenomenal um let's not let's not play around but the Mallory Manson feature is interesting because I understand you know Kanye's got this thing where he doesn't like cancellation right he doesn't like people getting cancelled he kind of always rooting for the underdog and for somebody of his stature somebody of his you know fame and celebrity and success and wealth it's pretty incredible that he can reach back down and say nah you're not going to cancel this person right especially if that person shows him love right because he said about you know the baby was one of the only people that vocally said he would vote for Kanye if he did run for president right when he was everyone was kind of laughing at him so cool he's loyal in that sense if you back him he'll back you but the Marilyn Manson one's an odd one because it's not like a misspeak. It's not like a misspoken thing, like what the baby did, right? Where he, maybe he wasn't as culturally aware or sensitive of what's going on and how times have changed. This is straight up. This guy's been accused of raping it. Like he's been accused of assault by various women in his life. Now, some people would argue, hey, if you're getting with Marilyn Manson, then you have to accept that he's a bit of a freak. You just have to look at the dude. You just have to kind of listen to his music, you know, look at the stuff that he's done in the past and a whole career of just outrage and and, you know, pushing the buttons and living a pure hedonistic artistic life is definitely going to bring um, some bad things with it, especially for the people that are nearest and dearest to you. Unfortunately, those are the ones that always have to suffer. So you could look at it and say, hey, these women should have known better by getting a relationship with Randall Manson. It was never going to be, you know, getting married to some John Smith guy and having a white picket fence and a couple of kids and a dog. But still some of the allegations some of the essays i forgot who the lady was i think she was from westworld right the main actress she read that massive kind of caption talking about everything like pressing charges i was like Oof, i don't know man plus he started to look a bit he started to look a bit crazy he's looking really bloated he's got that sort of drunk alcoholic um you know um weekly cokehead kind of bloat about him right he just looks a little bit inflamed which usually speaks to somebody you know sat at home with the blinds closed not really trying to go outside and court attention so for Kanye to step up and have him 
right front and center with him outside of his mother's home right they recreated that stadium was pretty wild um but again that's why you love the guy in it because he's willing to take those chances he's willing to put together essentially a 27 track gospel album with some of the biggest stars around in hip-hop at the moment get them to not curse for the most part and also you know feature two of the most cancelled people in society at the moment right one in hip-hop and one in kind of pop culture and you know the baby and uh what's his name and marilyn manson and unfortunately it just sounds really good so that's the problem people have now unfortunately it sounds amazing so that's where you have to kind of get to the point where you decide can i separate the art from the artist and that's definitely one of those tracks you have to kind of figure out because there's no denying that that jail 2 is just phenomenal it's much better than jail 1 let's not kill let's not say anything more anything less than that that is just a fact and it is what it is um another great feature that i think doesn't really get a lot of um probably won't get a lot of shine is um the 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 what you call it the new girl they featured on there the what's his what's her name shensia shensia smashes it she's on two tracks okay okay part two and double check this one there's a really good one that she comes on no okay okay part two is further than that one which one was that one not sunday riley rich is obviously really good he 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 riley rich marries really well with kanye hopefully they drew some sort of mixtape or a couple more tracks together i think their tones and their voices go really well I thought that was a really good collaboration. So, Shensia is on. Oh yeah, that's it. Pure Souls. That's the one we wrote. So she's on Pure Souls and Okay Okay Part Two. She's a really great addition to it, especially Pure Souls. God damn it, her voice comes in behind heavenly as hell. Um, she sounds really great. It's really amazing. I don't know. I'm not sure who added her last minute dot com onto the album or kind of you know got um, basically kind of got her attention. I'm not really sure whether her coming out in that jerk chicken barbecue thing was a thing that kind of sparked its interest. But regardless, man, that was a collaboration I didn't see coming. That sounded amazing. If anything, it sounded similar. She sounded similar in tone to somebody like a zero seven zero shake. So maybe that was what that track was. It might have been a reference that they probably have maybe replaced Shake with and see. I'm not sure. But regardless, she does hold her own. And again, it's for someone like her as a fairly new artist to get that kind of a look and a shine. Hopefully that will be the push that she needs to kind of blow up because she's super talented. Really great freestyles. I think she's got one with Flex. That's really, really good. I really recommend you check that out. And she had one of the best performances I thought at um, a pretty mediocre festival in, um, what was it? Was it the Rolling Loud or was it something else? It was raining. She did a really good performance almost like stage show all in it it's like super dance hall um culture wise in terms of loads of dancers and routines and stuff going on it was really fun so that was excellent to see but of course not everyone is a fan of the album so this is an article or review here from the guardian which basically says don the kanye west review misfire and lyricism from a diminished figure two out of five and i'm curious again off the back of the the breakfast club review and how they've been reviewing it and basically saying he's a clown and a circus show basically attributing more to the whole you know uh controversy that happened around the baby's feature who 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 didn't approve it who did approve it so you know the breakfast club guys were kind of setting the tone in that regard but i just went just to see what people think who weren't fans of the actual album itself because I, I just can't get it i can't get how anybody can listen to this and not like it because sonically musically the way it's mixed especially if you listen to the live versions of the album when you listen to it finally the final project of a final pro, pro, yeah, product that we have now available on the streaming platforms it sounds incredible it sounds expensive um it sounds like somebody you know because uh, who knows how much he spent on this album because that's the thing you have to remember too free live listening parties in these massive stadiums all the uh, for, for, uh, don't get me wrong he sold a lot of merch but still the amount of people featured the amount of engineers that have to kind of you know make the album work <laughs> he could easily be in a red for this album easily and he still you know went out of his way to artistically put it together in that way um it, it just kind of bleeds through the final product so it's impossible to kind of view that or listen to it and not like it for the majority of it now don't get me wrong the the, the length might be a bit too much for you because i think people nowadays just don't really want anything above 10 tracks or maybe max 14 12 but still sometimes when it comes to the bigger the bigger artists right the ones at the top tier the more the merrier because you're not going to hear from them for too long i mean he's not, it's not like he's going to drop a track or an album every other year or every year he's definitely going to do something every two years or maybe even longer so the fact that he's able to give us 26 plus tracks or whatever it is no 27 plus tracks is definitely um something that i am a fan of but anyway the guardian aren't fans of it 
They said here, Kanye West done a review misfiring lyricism from diminished figure. A diminished figure. I wonder why they say this. So it said, yeah, chaotic preview events for the Kanye's 10th studio album, Donda, have dominated social media feeds in recent weeks. Each one promising a release date and never materialised. The coverage of the events has focused on Kim Kardashian dressed as a Balenciaga clad sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> okay, these guys are fans of them. Like, oh, isn't it? 50, $50 chicken tenders, potential Drake disses, levitations and cameos from alleged rapist Marilyn Munson and homophobic the baby ouch they're coming firing fans called west a genius capable of creating excitement theater and evolves uh, in real time others saw him as an empty provocateur provocateur um much like a kindred spirit donald trump west seems to um instinctively know how to weaponize controversy to drive interest in a new project cool that is fairly true but unfortunately nowadays weaponizing controversy is the only way to garner any kind of attention um you look at people that i featured previously here like lizzo um, you look at people that I previously featured here, like do not do really is not a good example, but yeah, that's two examples. With Lizzo, is either you you manufacture controversy by consistently keeping yourself in the headlines. With Dua Lipa, you either pay a record label to com, co, to continually place your ads in certain places. You know, I'd love for somebody to count how many times Pop Crave posts about Dua Lipa in a week or less le than a month, right? There's definitely a concerted effort to make sure she's always in front and center, inside, in your face, and consistently presented to you on every part of social media to the point where you can't ignore her music and you can't avoid her, her face in any way, shape, or form. So that is just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. The, the, the days of artists just slaving in the studio and quietly releasing an album with no fanfare or marketing, it just doesn't exist because there's just too much money to be made and too much money on the line for you to risk a potentially putting out an album that no one's going to listen to why not try to drive controversy especially if you know the work is good so that people can listen to it um i'm not a fan of people just drive you know drumming up controversy like you know the little Nas x for instance a good example and the music is fairly mediocre like do you know what i mean like his his career is essentially devolved into nothingness after uh, old Town Road, which is a pretty interesting and you know uh exciting track would have kind of spurned and maybe a new trend in terms of hip-hop you know country mix whatever and now he's basically devolved into what being a crap caricature of lady gaga for instance so controversy just is what it is i don't think people should get their tits all in a bubble for that it continues said with the eventual release of Donda, named after West's English professor mother who died in 2007, there is a nagging sense that the spectacle has overshadowed the actual music, with the bloated 108 minute album rarely sure of what it's trying to say. Yes, it is. It's just a celebration of God. I don't know why it's trying to say. Of course it is. It's talking about his struggle, it's talking about his pain. If anything, this album is a better, it's a better representation of Kanye West's Christian journey if that makes any sort of sense. I think in the beginning, it did feel a little, a little bit like a gimmick. It did feel like he was trying to, you know, publicly redeem himself after all these different things that he's gone through. But, you know, in pure good music, done the fashion or that whole crew, even Virgil's the same way. One of the great things about them is that they love to learn out loud. They love to learn in public, right? They love to learn in the middle of the flipping town square. They're not away in their studio you know toiling on their craft they'll do that too but they want to learn out, out loud in real time and because of that you see some guy that's not a fully formed you know religious dude at the moment going out in front of camera and talking about things that he probably shouldn't be talking about or he's not that well versed in and stumbling over his words misspeaking here and there you know making himself look like a fool blah blah blah, blah. and it eventually gets to this point where you feel like minus all the you know veiled threats of drake <laughs> it feels like this is a proper gospel album it feels like it feels like a proper modern interpretation this feels like what you should hear if you go to like a spack nation if you're to go to like a hill song if you're to go to like what is that what that church is it hill song as well that church that justin bieber's pastor goes to the one that always has top off all those that's what it feels like it should sound like and this is it fully formed which is why you know if you're a gospel rap artist unfortunately this is the level that you've got to match because usually gospel hip-hop is a bit crap right the only good gospel hip-hop that i listened to back in the day was like g-force right this little um free um free person rap crew that were used to that spawned out of kscc that i used to go to back in the day and they were amazing right one of the only sort of like gospel acts that i saw growing up that was equally as good as the stuff i was listening to on radio and whatnot or whatever listen to at home really 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 good but it's difficult at this moment to kind of you know compete with middle of the road acts in hip hop because gospel music is just a little bit limiting but I think Kanye has done the best representation of it so far so I think it's pretty clear what he's trying to say it's a guy it's an older dude trying to basically you know wrestle with his faith and with his fame and with his wealth and with his network and with his voice blah blah blah, blah. it's fairly easy but again I, don't, I just don't think these people like him so it continues 
It says the Indra donned the chant a sequence of eerie re re recitations of his mother's name, seemingly designed to send you into a sunken place as a resting, giving you an impression that you're about to undergo an immersive religious experience. But too often the songs that follow are built on half-baked ideas from West more concerned with self-pity and martyrdom than, confort than confronting his contradictions. I don't know what they're talking about here. I'm sure he's aware of his contradiction. Like I said, those veil threats to Drake and then putting out a gospel album is a fairly strong contradiction. I don't think he would kind of deny that, right? The fact that he's posting up guys address and talking about what's spinning the block, but then he's also talking about his love for Christ. It's just funny. Um, it just is what it is. We're all we're all flawed, hypocritical human beings. It continues, said over the slightly flat dad rock riffs of jail. Um, oh, that's that's mean. Flat dad rock chief. Come on, man. West is reunited with his watch the throne partner Jay Z, who boasts that he can convince his long time foe to give up the red maga cap but the song's melody me meanders and wes's lyrics um, feel blunted in the past he had a sharp punchline face it jerome got more time than brandon he rapped in 2010 um, definitely highlighted racial equality in the u.s justice system here he lethargically repeats the question and guess who's going to jail um, it, without ever really landing on what he's implying he could easily be read as a moan about cancer culture which it is he does the same thing on God Breathe, a trap anthem and prosperity, that marries Christianity is transcendence with a rush of rave. West repeats how no God breathed on this, like he's running through a potential three hundred and fifty T shirt slogan with marketing manager. Like a lot of West post Life of Pablo work, these songs feel stitched together and rushed. I don't know how sure anyone can listen to Don though feel like it's rushed. If anything, it feels expensive and it feels really well done. Like especially if you hear the streams from the first stream to the final products like so what we've had three four versions of this album the three live the three live versions and the one that we have all on our phones and they all sound drastically different some of the tracks maybe sound better on some of the live streams depending on who you speak to but for the most part it sounds really really well done um you can definitely understand why he was on the phone screaming to flip in uh, Mike Dean or whatnot. It continues as hearing this bit in there, wallow in self pity, everything that you do, God. So, so everything that you do good, it just gets unnoticed. West complains of Jesus Lord and claim he's anti commercial on keep my spirit alive, reveals his lack of self awareness and means his big emotional moments, such as pondering whether death will finally reunite with his mother or buckling under the surge, the strain of divorce, cussing out your baby mother. Guess what? that's why we call it custody um don't fully connect west is lacking in the things that once made him so compelling as a songwriter self-deprecation elder the jerk she said and you're and you are what you eat went a right line in 2010 the devil's a new dress and a sense of humor to cut through the moments of tension the atmosphere here is solemn aside from the odd dad joke here and there some say adam could never be black because a black man never shared his rib self lubrication interesting point it's fairly decent point to make maybe it's because i would say most of the reason why that is probably gone is because of his content or because of his religion right he's become a born again christian so maybe some most of that self deprecation kind of goes away because you can sometimes become more self-actualized when you give your life to some sort of faith or whenever you give your life to christ when you give your life to religion yeah when you commit to some sort of religious practice you definitely become less um self-effacing you probably will come more assured of yourself and you leave the self-deprecation to maybe your prayers, I would assume. Um, it's less of a boasting sort of thing, right? And sometimes it feels like self-deprecation in some points is a way for you people or humans in general to connect with others because you don't want to kind of, you know, you don't want to separate yourself too much. You want people to know that you, you're going through exactly the same things that they're going through, the self that and whatnot. But when you're a you know, mega superstar like these sort of people, you kind of for better for lack of a better term for better for worse you kind of believe your own shit you kind of believe you are who you say you are if god if you know if if god if kindly thinks he's god he definitely thinks it he's not just saying it for the sake of it um so it's hard to kind of it's hard to kind of wrap your head around somebody who thinks so highly of themselves also deciding that they're going to be self-deprecating on an album like this especially if their 10th album at the age he's at with the success he's got it's just an impossible thing to re kind of request from somebody it continues said a one and an undeniably excellent moment in believe is believe what i say which utilizes lauren hill's healing coups of a classic do-up um for a more up-tempo soul song which west reminds himself not to be dragged down by the fame it's a record's most restorative moment 
moment, just like Ghost Town was a midi otherwise uneven yay. Meanwhile, Hurricane, which features the baby in the weekend, contains a massive hook from the latter that projects walk on water confidence. There is a lot of okay, thank God. I thought they were gonna say they didn't like the hurricane. If they said they didn't like hurricane, I'd say these guys are insane. There are a lot of di- there's a lot to digest when your life is always moving, West Spitz, reflecting on the progressing from school dropout to guest speaker at Yale. On this track, he he feels more like a human being and less like somebody delivering the doctrine of a corporate supercharge. Similarly, Lord I Need You has an intimate details of his collapsing marriage and is an affecting moment of frailty, even if the memory of we used to do the freak seven days a week has him sounding like Jim's dad in American Pie. <laughs> this old man rock stuff as well. He is an old man though, right? Isn't he like in his 40s, Kanye? Fast approaching his 50s in an industry where... So in an industry, in a scene where he's what? He's competing with Drake who is effectively 10 years his junior, who is making songs for people 10 years younger than him. He's he's kind of fighting a losing fight for the most part, right? It's impossible to try and compete with that guy, which is why I think this album is the best way to battle him because effectively you're just doing what you're doing. You're not trying to make the stuff that Drake does because he can never make the stuff that Drake does. His stuff is never going to bang in the clubs the way that Drake is going to bang in the club. It just is what it is. Well, for sure, when Certified Lover Boy comes out, there's going to be at least five tracks on there that are going to go off in the clubs, right? Go off in the festivals, go off in the live shows. And Kanye's just never going to be that guy because it's a moment, it's a phase. He's not locked in with the kids like that. He's not about like that. You know what I mean? He's just, you know, he is where he is. So this old man jibes was weird because he is an old man i think this album is a celebration of being old and having a complex life and dealing with family and marriage and being a father and whatever it's just that's what it sounds like to me i don't think that's a good criticism i think it is what it is it's continuous as a harsh fact is that the best verses on donda don't come from kanye brooklyn drill rapper five year foreign lights up the stirring yes go of course finally this is something i agree with off the grid with lyrical grenades about his face tattoos being a marker of truth baby cream mixes worship with dark um carnality on the mosh pit um with his auto-tune driven verse on praise god definitely he's a strong word during electronica knits aztecs and ottomans with the nation of islam and wakanda if you know what's monk and modern imperialism into the cryptic worldview of jesus lord while surrealist thug west side gun floats over keep my spirit alive but that's bait though and you already knew why people i don't know if this guy personally is white or not but you already know someone like a guardian is always going to like flipping jay electronica and west side gun right it's just the archetypal sort of artists that those guys will kind of be into you know those kind of tofty hipsters that pretend they like hip-hop and the only people they listen to are kendrick jay electronica and maybe a little bit of griselda like it's just typical it continues chicago jules bluesman little dirk talks about the the recent murder of his brother on Jonah and powerfully references a niece and nephew now without a father West clearly inspires frank admission from all the artists on Dunda who treat him like a priest they visited and group therapy that's very true that's a very fair description because that's one part you did especially when you listen to the stream live for the first time it was impressive to see all these people that you hear you know in general on billboard charts and mixes and just you know they're on your current place or hip-hop tracks to hear those same people you know rap or spit or sing without cursing it was incredible because it was like you could feel the restraint you could feel them trying to like you know struggling to use words that didn't end with bitch or whatever it may be right they had to kind of find other words to fit into their raps and for the most part it did bring out the best in everybody i thought especially five year for a good big example like he sounds incredible that verse is ugh that should definitely get a wheel up in the club and it ends it says disappointing that wes is unable to match the clarity of thought he coasts by with ghost ball fragments that don't really go anywhere something particularly evident on come to life with a piano line that pulls the heartstrings in a manner of a cancer charity tv commercial it's hard to tell a billionaire what to do and a lack of self-edit means donda often sags huh a record that is attributed to the powerful black woman who lacks much itself from female perspective beyond old audio clips of speeches by Donda West and an eventful strong um, ghost guest spot by Shinisa um, Sh- Sh- Shinisia with how you pronounce it on OK OK Part 2 on his 2004 studio debut the college dropout west at times an anti-consumerist who joked about our exception of material goods and brand affinity years later he's come full circle a venture capitalist who had to talk to god through old ceilings gold ceilings sorry on the most albums uh, the at the heart of Dundas crowdsourced music is a diminished figure one at odds with the witty rule break of the past i don't understand what these guys mean do you think i don't know i think it's um do you think sid vicious can be sid vicious forever I don't think what I don't know what they want. Like it's like um, 
I don't know. To, it's if it's just a good example. Like, how long can you be that guy when you when you're in your fifties with two kids and you've got a dad bod? It's just impossible to be that agent provocateur pushing buttons. And plus, it gets a little bit it gets a little bit corny. People get tired of that gimmick when you're past a certain age or when you moved on to a certain stage in your life. It just isn't the same. So I'd much rather see my artists grow into these complex, interesting human beings that we all have to kind of wrestle with because we have these real idealistic memories of what they used to be as opposed to just kind of you know a repetition of their greatest hits so who wants that who wants to have a 44 version of you know college dropout you don't want that it's just it would just be a bit sad i want to hear him you know experiment i want to hear him kind of go into different fields and if anything kind of becoming a christian now has probably limited the amount of stuff you can talk about but it's also kind of really lasered in how he approaches music and it's probably why this is probably the best version of what we've been able to listen to so far because life life of saint pablo or life of pablo and then yay were ones that you felt like were in the middle not really sure where he was going he was going through a lot of stuff anyway personally and now this is the fully actualized version of him he's in his studio doing push-ups he's wearing incredible clothes he's got his family around him friends and stuff the first time i've seen don c hanging around him in public for a long time he's there and all these people like for sure this is the reason why it's come it's been some of the best stuff you've heard he's like a multi-billionaire um he's, he's doing better than ever he's designing flipping musical instruments right he's doing the great stuff so i'm surprised that my opinion this is probably the best recognition rest, best rendition of this version of christian yeah that we've definitely seen but you know i don't agree with thomas hobbs from the guardian but it's good to hear other people's opinions on stuff you like because it, i think it sharpens and hones in your view on the stuff that you like as well because there's too much talk about things you hate and all of things you love but sometimes it's good to kind of contrast the two things so definitely check that out matt if you haven't already it's obviously out this weekend and i'm sure most people have listened to it moving on moving on what has happened oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah i went out this weekend um first time in a long time um to go out in a club properly and go for a rave go for a boogie go for a dance and i have to admit it was an experience it was an experience first of all i'm never traveling more than an hour to a club ever again in my entire life especially because of the area where i live in there's you know a whole bevy of clubs maybe 10 plus great clubs within a 40 minute distance of where i live so to travel an hour plus to go somewhere is just insane i think the train journey from loft studios to my house was about or loft, to my house to loft studios about what an hour and then you add in the 20 minute walk from the station to the venue easily an hour 20 so it's definitely too far for that for that regard but sometimes for the a caliber artist or a caliber djs like Gerd Janssen you definitely do it and I guess this is a fair reflection a fair, maybe a reminder for me in general or a reminder for a lot of people whenever people are out there criticizing and getting angry annoyed at the whole business techno thing it's a hard thing to kind of wrangle with because on one side it's a bit boring because these same people get booked at all the same venues not but not good answer it's not a good example but you mean the higher echelon people right the ones that are like in the top the ones that are in the top middle bracket and top bracket those guys and girls usually get booked in the same lineups the same clubs the same festivals all the time and it can be a little bit frustrating as a fan of this music as a fan of the scene as I become a DJ, it can be, it can feel like, you know, there's no way for you to kind of get up there because those people, especially DJing, it's not like any other form of music. You could do it into your 60s, right? Into your 70s, if, even if you wanted to. There is no kind of age for you to retire because, you know, it's what it is. It's kind of one of the rare evergreen musical careers. So it's hard to kind of get in and people kind of, you know, um, deal a lot in personal relationships and friendships and networking. So unless you're in that hallowed little group, it's hard to kind of find your little angle to burst through. But there is no denying that the people at the top, for the most part, are there on merit. Let's just call a spade a spade. There's not a lot of people that I would probably leave my house to travel to go and see for 50 plus minutes. And God, the answer is definitely one of them. I kind of discovered him, if I'm not mistaken off the back of maybe some streams i might have watched on boiler room of him at robert johnson the acclaimed uh club in frankfurt that i went and visited in what 2010 or something right one of the best clubs in europe for sure small overlooking an amazing lake uh great setting great sound great punters in general they select the, the door really well and he was amazing in there so sort of ricardo Ver lobos in there too but really eclectic DJ, great taste. He's able to play a lot of the 
disco-y type stuff that I'm into, a lot of the indie dance sort of tracks, but also he's able to kind of punch it up um, in a way that you don't really see a lot of people do that, kind of play the music he plays, right? He kind of doesn't just stay in that pocket. You can kind of take it a bit further. Like, you know, if you ever listen to like a Tiger and Wood set, right? They're usually incredible, right? Like loads of great edits, but after like 40 minutes, you can get a little bit savvy, a little bit repetitive. But he has the ability to, to kind of take it up a notch, similar to like a, you know, if you go see a DJ Harvey play, you know, when I saw Harvey play at Berghain, he was playing in the main room, not even a panorama bar, which is mad to think, right? And he absolutely destroyed it. And usually if you know if you know how Berghain is, you'll know that the panorama bar is usually the place where people play more house and disco. And obviously Berghain is usually more the place, you know, they play the harder, uh, harder techno sort of stuff. That's where you see a lot of people in the bondage and the black and all that malarkey. And he was able to still captivate and hold that crowd's attention. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is the levels. So when you complain about these business techno guys you have to just realize that maybe through practice because they've been able to play those stages and they've been able to play that profile club all the time but they are where they are for a reason and you know that club was completely full at love studios we went the day before to see todd turge and the crowd was far more it was far more densely packed than it was at todd turge um go and play the what a four hour set in the sort of garden foyer bit then he went into the main room for another four hours or maybe a bit longer than that and just took everybody on a bit of a journey they had great um you know lights great kind of you know installation -y kind of fabric things hanging on them or hanging off them from the roof everyone tripping balls great bar no cash just straight cards so it made things easy no queues anywhere toilets located all over the place um great ventilation most of the doors were open they had fans in each corner so when it got hot you could just kind of move over they get a bit cool and keep it moving a really really great experience i have to be honest um, i recorded a little clip that's here on my uh, twitter that i'll play for you let's play it here this is me at the front of the stage where the answer's in the main room uh playing and doing what he does best <laughs> amazing amazing experience but let's be honest as well like spending what well, no taking a year and a half out of raving and not being on the dance floor definitely took its toll especially by the second day my feet were banging my legs were sore brain was vibrating and i couldn't get out of there quick enough <laughs> i think we didn't even stay to the end i think we stayed until about three or something and then got an uber back home but a fairly fairly decent rave and just great to be back on the dance floor again right surrounded by random strangers sweaty rubbing shoulders you know um engaging in asinine repetitive questions and conversations about how happy you are that you're out again and you know what you've been doing and people that you like to go and see daddy daddy da. it's just it's just fun no one can deny it. like i said there's no as much as as great as streams are i think streams are decent because they've leveled the playing field especially for someone like myself who's kind of trying to break in and get my way in obviously i've got an ability to record a set upload it onto youtube where everyone's got their same set so I'm, 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 I'm kind of operating on the same playing field as everybody else that's great obviously but there's no replacing um being in the venue right there's no replacing kind of standing around with real people and hearing stuff of on a sound system it definitely goes a long way and it probably may be heightens your enjoyment of the tracks for sure he played a lot of good tune, new tunes that would we'll definitely end up getting tune id'd on a few pages later on and those tunes definitely sound a lot better when you're in the club because he's playing it at Pacific tempo. He's playing it with, you know, Pacific maybe channels or sorry, Pacific, um, um, you know, um, maybe the bass is higher the mids are lower whatever right he's done something in the actual venue that makes it sound different as it comes through the, the main system and speakers it just sounds a little bit different so you end up kind of liking choose a lot more that you probably wouldn't like if you just listen to them on your airpod speakers or through your laptop speakers or whatever it just doesn't hit hit the same but yeah um 
for sure the 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 experience or the kind of you know the experience that we've all had for being out of raves for the last year and a half has definitely um taken its toll and i think more so because of the lack of routine not routine repetitiveness of it right like for the most part i would be going out what every thursday and saturday mostly mostly to dj myself but also to kind of go out for enjoyment's sake so i was getting that practice of being on my feet being outdoors having a couple of drinks, having a dance and going home sort of vibing and kind of doing it again. And when you've not been doing it for a year and a half, it's hard to get back into it, which is why I understand and sympathize with people who just kind of move on and don't want to get back into it. Because once you move on and you fill your time with other things, it's hard to kind of justify going into a club surrounded by people that are super drunk or super high. It just doesn't make any sense. So you have to have the temperament and the willingness to go and do it in the first place to subject yourself to it. Um, the people around me or the people around us for the most part were definitely off their faces. It was definitely interesting to see that for the most most part the crowd that we were we were surrounded by i would say maybe 40 maybe 30 percent of people knew who was playing most of the people just came for had to have a knees up and have a bit of a dance which is completely understandable but it definitely went to show that maybe the first maybe towards the end of the year we'll probably see a lot more people going specifically for nights but people are still sort of just getting there or scratching their sort of like need to go out itch first as opposed to kind of going and following certain people who they're going to play and usually maybe it's also another reflection of the fact that the people that do go to follow specific DJs are usually tourists and foreigners and without them you know there isn't that same sort of crowd that exists but still I enjoyed it I thought it was a fairly decent um, event Labyrinth put it on great production um always kind of well done i think we went to see tricks play a labyrinth event at mixed garage a few months ago and that was all that was before lockdown maybe i think i'm not too sure when that was but that was incredible and this was equally as good great production especially because good played outside for a little bit on the system was a little bit more limited a little bit more lower sound wise but definitely um up there still in terms of how they produced and put it together security guards were fairly on point everything was really well done they had you know um ladies kind of going around and making sure they're picking up glasses and cups so there wasn't a lot of pile up of rubbish everywhere that was all done and for the most part everyone was on a great good behavior there's a few people being naughty on the dance floor but for the most part everyone knew what to kind of do and i think it made for a good crowd so definitely one of the most uh definitely one of the better nights i've been to anyway as a, uh, as a post lockdown event so definitely something that i was excited to go to and i can't wait to go to more man it's great to be back on the dance floor big up labyrinth big up gerd jansen and everybody that i bumped into over there definitely a good night um next on the list here let's talk about united versus wolves that's me so united won one nil yeah united won one new away from home against wolves and it was the performance that we all kind of expected to see from united especially off the back of the announcement that you know christian Ronaldo would uh, be re-signing for the club um i think most of us most fans who are objective and aren't you know only sexuals as they call them on the social media feed and you know um aren't people that you would find on the strefford paddock youtube channel whatever when we look at our team the last thing we think is that we need like more attacking talent if anything we think we need more midfielders we need more you know defensive midfielder specifically or maybe some cut or maybe some options at right back specifically to kind of improve the way we attack as a team collectively but it definitely is a problem with how we're coached and how we build up our play for the most part i think maguire for the most part i think the back line with the exception of iran isn't the best on the ball i think all the players have their flaws um there's no way of progressing the ball from the keeper to the defense to the defensive midfield or to the order to the two players playing in that double pivot and then kind of forwarding it onto the players in the attacking positions it just doesn't work too well and there's a lack of coaching and just understanding maybe what the best option is maybe it's maybe going a lot more you know uh uh route one maybe that's a great option i'm not really sure but at the moment i think a lot of objective fans can realize that and for all the attacking talent we have we do play quite mediocre football it just feel like a little bit of an individual brilliance fc we give up we give the ball to some of our better players and hope that they're able to produce a piece of magic and this game against wolves was a good example of it mason green was able to pop up on the 80th minute and you know finish and put to well, finish a pretty decent move um really really well like incredibly well he did this kind of you know um 
he did this kind of trademark step over with a finish, low finish into the far corner, expertly done. The keeper kind of got a hand to it, but it still managed to trickle into the bottom corner because there was too much power and precision in the shot. Like incredible, right? The kid's a star, absolute star. He's able to pop up with minutes, with last minute quote unquote winners or influential goals, decisive goals in games. It's really otherworldly, especially considering his age. Um, you could definitely see him kind of scoring more and more goals as the years progress and he becomes more experienced and he maybe slowly but surely kind of moves from the wing into the central midfield position or central striker position but that aside the game itself was i thought fairly terrible from us um the, the, the double pivot in the middle didn't work i think um fred and pogba had a really hard time in the first half especially fred i think pogba didn't do any better really for the most part even though he was trying i think he came in his own a little bit in the second half um fred really kind of threw up a lot of questions in terms of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's selection whether or not i think fred selection fred's constant selection for united especially playing in a double pivot it's further evidence that maybe Oli just doesn't rate Donny van der Beek because there's no way anybody can say that Donny van der Beek would play as worse or maybe worse than Fred has played in the last two games for the most part he just sometimes and that's the thing with Fred it's not really his fault because I think he's just one of those players he either plays an 8 out of 10 or 4 there's no room in between he just is what it is um, and I think in general a player like Fred might be best suited to play alongside a real disciplined, um, traditional, quote-unquote, defensive midfielder because he kind of engages more. He goes wondering. Um, again, he might misplace a pass here or two. So you need that other defensive midfielder to kind of clean up some of his mess, right? That's what I think happens. When really the, the kind of key way to do it is to have the Fred character be like a Kovacic, right? Who is a lot more responsible a lot more careful a lot more cute a little bit more cultured on the ball he doesn't lose it as often so that you've got two really tenacious ball winning midfielders in like Kovacic and maybe a Georgino and maybe a Kante playing in that midfield position that's where it kind of really comes to its own but when you have a player like Pogba who isn't the best press who isn't the most press resistant especially from in front of deep um and you got someone like a Fred who again isn't the best most press resistant and also gives the ball away it just leads to a lot of lost possession in the middle of the park and one of the biggest things that happened I thought in the game I think a lot of people recognize it because I see a lot of people tweeting and sharing images and screenshots is that when we line up in this sort of like 4-2-3-1 formation right with Bruno Fernandes sort of playing as a number 10 in front of Fred and Pogba so, so they're kind of playing in like a wide triangle position but what ends up happening when you actually watch the game I think I've argued this for a very long time said to people Bruno Fernandes isn't a really good midfielder he's an, obviously an amazing finish of the ball probably up there with, he's probably one of the better strikers in the league even though he's not a traditional striker but in terms of being a midfielder being able to receive the ball in a half turn drop a shoulder pass the ball like he just does, doesn't have it he's not not number 10 not in the let's say in a conventional sort of like you know Philippe Quartino way right in when he was at when he was at Liverpool that ability to kind of dribble past a player touch a ball control it skip one pass uh, maybe shoot obviously the shooting is definitely similar if not better than Quartino because his accuracy is really incredible but in terms of being a midfielder and being disciplined in that position he's not so what ended up happening in that game against Wolves is that you saw Fred or Pogba whenever they got on the ball and they looked up to pass to somebody this entire front line of Sancho Greenwood James and Bruno Fernandes was in one line there was no there was massive bits of space in between these guys and you had to basically if you were Fred or Pogba I think I mentioned on Twitter the other day you had to essentially thread a ball through the eye of a needle to find one of your attacking players and then you had to hope that they were able to skip past seven or two players in order to get a, a shot on goal when really the, the the kind of progression that you'd want is that you'd want your number 10 and your number six and let's say your number four to be kind of carrying the ball in the midfield a little bit a little bit further up the pitch and then they'll be trying to find one of these three in James uh, Greenwood or Sancho right that's what you'd want from them you don't want you don't want the ball just to go from that so far deep all the way up front because there's just too much distance to cover players are going to in, come in between and what ends up happening is they're going to get hit on the counter a lot of times that's what basically kept happening to us there's a lot of space you, you saw, especially when you saw Adama Traore he's already really strong runner on the ball he was just running into like acres of space right because again there was what we weren't compact enough in the midfield and I think playing against Wolves, which, you know, they're fairly decent um, opposition. I think, you know, um, House and Senate the other day on his channel, you know, I don't know what people expected. The Wolves are a good team. Yes, we, we know they're a good team, but we didn't play well. We played really badly. Um, we let Wolves disturb our game too much. Um, we kind of played into their hands. Um, we didn't really get ourselves situated and balanced too often. And I feel like unless Greenwood did pull out that absolute individual moment of brilliance, I don't think people could argue or say that we had a real chance of winning that game. It felt like more of a game where Wolves 
possibly should have won they had a lot of really good clear cut chances and this is again a further example of maybe this is our proof that needs that maybe you can win the league with just having good players I don't think you can I think you need to have a good manager too or at least like a very competent coach that can bring out the best in those players and put them in the correct formation and know how to rotate properly know how to you know, do the correct substitutions because I thought the substitutions were insane um, for the most part what were they I think if, if anything he, who did he brought on I think he brought on like Cavani first or something no is it no I think he brought on Cavani and then Martial insane substitutions when you think that we were getting overrun in the midfield essentially end up working for the best because you know um all those strikers and attacking players end up occupying other midfielders so maybe greenwood got ignored somewhat on the right hand side we switched on the wing which kind of led to his goal but overall the substitutions were insane didn't make any sense whatsoever so Part of me thinks it's difficult to expect a manager like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to win the league, especially when you look at the other managerial talents that he has to compete against, the two shorts, the clubs, the peps. Um, it's just difficult to expect him to do that. But then on the other side, it makes me think maybe if we just give him the right players and because he's able to provide a safe, fun atmosphere for the players, they don't really seem like they feel like they're too under pressure. They all seem kind of relaxed, even though, again, the football is pretty diabolical. They're all pushing each other. There's a lot of competition for places. Um, um, there's that nice competitive spirit around the team in general right without it being too mean-spirited especially when it was under Jose Mourinho maybe we could kind of good vibes our way to a league title but I just don't see it because there's been no so far no real example of an average coach being able to win the league people will say Manuel Pellegrini but I still think Manuel Pellegrini is a far better coach than Ole Gunnar Solskjaer right I think his CV's proved that I think a lot of people are sat there think even the biggest fans of Ole can't really sit there and think if he leaves United he's going to have the pick of the litter in terms of clubs he can pick and you or especially if he's uh, you know been as successful as they say he has and usually a manager of his ilk you know managing a club like United you should if you end up leaving United and you do a good job you should end up being able to pick whatever club you want and basically walk into them right I'll be able to kind of put your application forward and be you know seriously considered and I don't think that's going to be the case with him so um, it's just interesting to see what's going to happen but again weird game we ended up winning because of individual moment the brilliance but again Greenwood was incredible that finish was just otherworldly um, I don't think there's many players in our team that could do that especially on the whim it was un it was unlucky or oh, it was kind of disappointing to see how um, this is disappointing to see how badly Jadon Sancho played again I think there isn't really a plan for him it feels like we don't really have an idea of how we want to utilise him we're just hoping he's going to replicate what he did at Borussia Dortmund I think a lot of our players are like that I think Bruno Fernandes just kind of not lucked into but he's sort of adequately set up for this team right in how he plays but in terms of a traditional players number 10 I don't think they would do that well in this team either because we don't really have a great way of transitioning the ball I think if I'm not mistaken someone told me or saw a stat that said Edson Cavani had like zero touches in the box and I think he came on before Martial I'm pretty sure he came on around the 60th minute or something like that and he had zero touches in the box which shows you yes maybe Edson Cavani isn't the most mobile of strikers you know even though he kind of makes a lot of runs um, fair enough and maybe he was getting marked and there was a lot of compacts there wasn't enough space in the defense of, of Wolves right they were a fairly well organized team but for your main striker or if your main one of your main strikers to come on in the 60th odd minute and not have a touch in the box that shows you that the ball's not progressing up the pitch in a kind of succinct kind of method methodical way right there's no real pattern of play or style of play that's kind of leading us to creating chances in a real measured and expected way for instance man city have got a way of playing where you know how they're going to score goals again and again right that cross into the box cut back or whatever and someone's going to latch onto it so far all our goals look like amazing candidates for goal of the month but there's not a real team way of how we construct them for the most part that's the only concerning bit i'd say going forward but again tough tough game to play we end up getting the victory there is an argument to be said if you want to win the league you have to win these games ugly and we managed to do that but the problem is I think against some of the lesser teams we end up not being able to turn we end up not being able to turn these performances in or some of our star players don't end up trying to have got the ability to win us the game and then we end up losing or win or or lose losing or drawing those games and I think that's the issue we need to improve how we play from minute one to the end of the game and kind of dominate matches a little bit, strike fear in the opponents, you know, kill them before half time to have a real chance of winning the league, I think. Because from what I've seen from Liverpool, from what I've even seen from Man City over the weekend, these guys are going to be on smoke and we can't really afford to just hope and pray some of our best players end up pulling us out of the mire. We definitely have to be a better collective team. And hopefully, with a couple of hours or days to go in a transfer window, we can still see um, developments. We can get maybe a midfielder in. I think there's talk already been happening of Dan James moving to Leeds 
Leeds for 30 million, which is insane considering, you know, I don't really rate the guy, but it's a great value. I think he's going to be a far better player playing for Leeds, especially under Bielsa's stewardship. He's going to be a far better coach for him than Oli would be, to be honest. I think he'll work better in their system. He'll develop more as a player and he'll get the minutes that he needs to kind of progress his career. But if we're able to take that money and maybe you know, put that into a defensive midfielder. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd much rather we go for like a Basuma than a Ruben Neves, which has been rumoured, or a really conventional, whatever else European defensive midfielder you want to get. But somebody needs to play in that position so he can free up a Pogba. Because in that position, in that formation, you can essentially have Pogba playing alongside that DM. You don't even need to play Fred. You know what I mean? That's the beauty of it. And then what you do is that it frees up Fred to be the replacement for a Pogba when you want him to give, a, give him a rest, or it frees up McTominay to be a replacement for somebody maybe playing in number 10 do you know what I mean it frees up positions a lot more it makes it a little bit more of an easier thing to do and also you don't have to rely on having two defensive midfielders playing in that position as opposed to playing one as most other big successful teams do but you know baby steps baby steps baby steps next on the list we've got news over the weekend Jake Paul defeated Tyron Woodley in another YouTuber versus MMA boxer fight thing that they're doing at the moment um i didn't watch the fight at live i had to kind of watch it back and in the morning i kind of quickly scanned to see who won and i was like oh again this Jake Paul guy manages to just keep pulling out these victories every time you think he's gonna lose and he's finally gonna get his just doers and he's finally gonna fight a quote-unquote real fighter he always manages to pull it out of the bag and maybe it's time where you all kind of start putting respect on the Paul brothers names and maybe quickly realize that sometimes life isn't fair and you know god blesses people with talents and genes that are able um, to kind of allow them to get into boxing what late in life and be able to kind of box with some of the greats and be able to hold their own maybe that's the case i don't know what the case is but in general a fairly impressive performance especially when he considered this was probably his hardest test in terms of he got rocked he looked like he was struggling a bit he adjusted and he ended up winning the fight i thought fairly easy i think the split decision thing at the end was pretty much insane but i thought it was a fairly easy fight um on paper Especially as a USC fan, I probably should have been more aware or I should have been more... I should have kept it in mind that Woodley has looked really bad, especially towards the tail end of his career in the UFC. I think it was four defeats back to back, which is not a big deal because, you know, the UFC, the talent roster is just insane. But the manner of his defeat, especially when you consider how dominant he was prior, it just led you to believe that this is just what it is, isn't it? Like the UFC, it's just a mean sport, combat sports in general. You just wake up one day and then suddenly you look the guy that he once was and his power diminished. He's kind of looked a bit hesitant in the ring and just looked a shadow of himself. So we should have known that that guy wasn't suddenly going to turn it on because the one thing we realize about MMA or we realize about combat sports over the years is that same would happen with Conor McGregor. It's fairly difficult to go from being really good and obviously going for a shit spell and then suddenly turning it back on again. You don't just turn it on. And whether it's the fame, whether it's the wealth, whether it's just father time knocking on your door, something happens to these guys where they just don't end up, you know, they don't they don't kind of sustain that ability to fight the way they did when they were younger in you know, as they progress in years. And it's just it's just a matter of life, I guess. And obviously him fighting, you know, a kid that's like, what, is he 24 or something, right? I don't know, right? It's something like that in his age. is never going to end well. It really wasn't. And, you know, um, it feels like Jake Paul has more to lose in this arrangement than Tyron Woodley does because for all the hype and the fame this guy has, it's only there because he's winning fights. I think we've seen it with Conor McGregor. The moment you start losing fights and the moment you start turning into a bit of a hill, that banter and that kind of cocky personality doesn't hit the same. People don't really like it. So Jake Paul's only kind of sustaining this momentum and this fame because he's winning. So I'm pretty sure he's aware of this. So there's a lot of pressure on his back to ensure that goes on because if he doesn't, it's going to stop the gravy train and this kind of alternate career that he's got because I think he's spoken about it quite often about how kind of blocked and bored he felt about making youtube content he felt like he did everything and he went to explore different things and this was it right he's finally found a kind of a purpose something that gives him structure it kind of keeps his feet grounded and keeps him out of trouble so he's definitely going to be fighting tooth and nail to make sure that he can you know um, keep it and of course prove the doubt was wrong because there's one thing he likes to be is hated he likes to be a heel more so than his brother does and he kind of bask in this kind of glory of people wanting to see him get knocked out and he keeps keeps on proving everybody wrong and this is the perfect fight for him to keep on proving people wrong because if there's one person that's going to hesitate and kind of you know uh be a little bit gun shy um it's definitely tyron woodley um there was parts i think was it second round where he kind of clipped um 
you know, Jake Paul, and it looked like he was going to go for the finish. And he just hesitated. He just kind of stopped for half a second. The same thing that you saw him do in UFC towards the end. And he just didn't hesitate. He hesitated to finish the job. He hesitated to kind of unload. He hesitated to really kind of wrap up the show or kind of fall in, or kind of down his sword. And in the end, Jake Paul won that fight pretty easy, I thought, from what I saw. But I don't know. Maybe we have to give this Jake Paul guy a little bit more respect because he definitely uh, put in a decent performance, especially when you see stuff like this on Twitter. It says here, Jake Paul is taking less money in his fight against Tyron Woodley so others can make more. As a result, everyone on the card is receiving a record payday. It's hard, again, like for all the negative stuff that he might have done in his past, it's really difficult to like this, not to like this guy, um, especially when you consider all the conversation around, you know, fighter pay in the UFC, Dana White being a little bit of a tyrant and not paying people, UFC fighters crying on camera about getting bonuses, people saying that they had negative balances in their account as they're going to fight in a cage with somebody with their, in their flipping underwear. It's just insane to think that these guys are fighting for like 30 grand, right? And half of that might go to taxes and your camp and you're left with just about nothing in terms of kind of putting your life for the line so to have somebody like a Jake Paul deciding to use his fame and his platform as an opportunity to remind people about how unfairly some of these fighters are getting paid and to kind of um, restore some parity and some balance to the fight promotion game is something admirable to see for sure and it's a quote from him it says I'm not just saying it I'm actually doing it that's taking money out of my pocket to give to all boxers on the card and the biggest payday of their lives it continues here it says um Jake Paul has been advocating for more money um, in combat sports in June. He donated to a GoFundMe for UFC Sarah Appler to cover a training cost for a fight. He then called out Dana White, telling the UFC president to pay our fighters more. And this is a quote from him. Dana White's never going to do that because, you know, it, it doesn't... For as much as I hate the guy and I think he's holding the sport back and I think the sooner Dana White leaves the UFC and replaces it with a president who's able to kind of, you know, be a little bit more fair and kind of... He, I don't know whatever happens Union Dana White leaves the UFC will definitely be in a far better place as a business when this guy goes for sure especially how he kind of talks to fighters and the grudges that he holds it's just not conducive to building a professional uh, combat you know organisation in the long run I just don't think it lasts forever especially you know when they get paid flipping pittance but at the moment he's got no owners to do it because there's no incentive right why would he pay people who aren't necessarily as famous as others more money even just because they're on the card because he knows you can get away with paying them less and then UFC pockets more of it and able to invest it into marketing so so but this is a quote a screenshot from uh, Jake Paul that he's calling out Dana White. He says, Dana White, you may have bullied your way into the controlling thousands of fighters' careers, but I have never said I want to sign for the UFC. Nor will I ever. Maybe I would consider letting you co-promote one of my events against UFC champion like you did Connor when he fought Floyd, which is something that people don't really know, that Dana White pocketed a lot of money on that fight because he basically allowed Connor to, especially the dispensation to fly for Floyd Mayweather. That's the only reason why he ended up fighting him. He continues here says, because you wouldn't let Connor actually do it himself without you taking a cut. You um, you live in lies and every major fighter on your roster has complained about pay. Connor, James, Masvidal, Diaz and Garno, you even wake up, sorry, you even make up felt belt, fake belts to sell tickets instead of giving Amen and Nunes opportunity to headline. Um, remember, Dana, you were a cardio kickboxing instructor and didn't even create a UFC. Garcia and Davey um, created it. The Fertitta saved it and the fighters made it popular. You're a bold, bold bum who couldn't do an interview now without even asking about me. Pay your fighters more. So you definitely have to kind of appreciate him for kind of putting that light on things like that and allowing everybody to make a big, big amount of money on it. And then it says here... Uh, he says Jake Paul's opponent Tyron Woodley has tried to discredit his efforts made by the boxers Paul says he made sure Woodley made four times his highest salary on payday for stepping into the ring with him um, da, 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 da. and of course towards the end I think Tommy Fury was also calling him out for a big fight which would definitely be a, 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 a pay-per-view number seller especially when you consider the fame Tommy Fury has here in the UK and maybe in parts of Europe too so again fairly enjoyable fight I think maybe a little bit embarrassing for Tyron Woodley considering you know how he kind of came, kind of got cut from the UFC you know off the back of those four losses so it's what five losses so far overall um maybe he's won a couple of rounds in those five losses he lost a shadow of his former self and he kind of got essentially outboxed by a a youtuber who only started boxing a few years ago so pretty embarrassing on that side but in terms of a spectacle and everything all in between definitely enjoyable watch and hopefully we'll see more of it especially the ability to kind of have the you know the main cut or the main headlining event be Jake Paul a whole YouTuber v somebody and then you fill the undercard with actual legit boxes I think it's great it gives those other guys a big platform and it also just boosts the sport in general so it definitely was great to see that I'm not going to lie I'm not going to lie um let's move on what's we got here 
But, 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 yeah, let's talk about this one. I haven't even read this properly, but this is a article here from the Hype Beast. It says, Nike is soon John Geiger. So there's a lot of these guys, isn't it? There's a lot of these kind of dudes that make these uh, Nike copies, right, of their sort of like most popular models, whether it's a Jordan 1, whether it's a Dunk, whether it's an Air Max, an Air Force. They take these kind of popular silhouettes and kind of update them in their own sort of way. Obviously, you know, there's been people have done this in history or in the history of streetwear has always been a thing. Obviously, the main example being Bapesa and, and, you know, Nico. And if you know the history of that, you'll know that the first iteration of the Bapesa, if you can still find them on like a Yahoo JP, are dramatically different to the stuff that we have available nowadays. They had to change it, you know, many, many times. I remember they had to update it, if I'm not mistaken, up to 100 times, little tweaks here and there to make it um a real different product to what nike were doing because obviously nike put the season to assist out when the baby originally came out because it was too similar looking to the air force one but if you actually marry or if you actually put a baby and an air force one side by side when it comes to paneling and the shape they're completely different so that's definitely something that a lot of these guys are really taking into consideration when they basically rip off a nike base model and just add their own sort of swoosh or motifs to the side of it you know you have to kind of go out of your way to re-engineer it from the ground up properly as opposed to just copying it and taking off the swoosh that's obviously lazy design but nike is not really having it over the last few years i think they put out a trademark for the jordan one and a few other things they're really trying to clean up shop and ensure these um little instagram pages and brands and stuff whatever don't have the ability to put food on their table and don't have the ability to put their kids through school by you know selling these overpriced knockoffs for lack of a better term this is a good example of it even though I like John Geiger, I think what was his dunk or Air Force One he did back in the day with all those swooshes? I think it was a black high top. I thought that was really well done. Um, he probably deserves to get a Nike collab. I, I wonder if maybe his unofficial, um, you know, um, repurposed nature of the stuff that he's done is basically, you know, um, talked him out of a bag. I'm not really sure, but it's a shame that he's not able to get a collab, especially when you see the other trash that people have been collaborating with nike on i think somebody like him deserves to definitely get a proper nike collab but i probably don't think it's going to happen now, especially when you're being sued or you're having a yeah essentially by nike it's not going to happen anytime soon so it says here the article says nike has filed a lawsuit against john geiger um la la land production and design in claiming that geiger's gf01 sneaker infringes on the air force one trade dress even a name gf01 why don't you call it gf05 you know what i mean come on Make a little bit of effort. In response, Geiger stated in an Instagram post that he's only he's been very clear through two years of manufacturing and said of GF1 that it was inspired by Nike and also made sure that anyone purchasing a shoe is aware that the designer shoe crafted with higher materials and quality along with a trademark um, and changes to the silhouette. A copy of the complaint was com was com obtained by Complex States by marketing and selling a shoe using Nike's registered Air Force One trade stress. John Geiger knowingly and intentionally creates confusion in the marketplace and capitalized on Nike's reputation and reputation of its icon shoe on one hand you could say you know i would bet my bottom dollar that nike probably make a billion at least if not more just selling a white air force one and a black air force one in like what in like a foot action jd sports foot locker right easy without even counting all the collaborations and the limited edition runs they probably make a billion or maybe close to a billion just of selling those base models the black and white air force one low easy so for them to go after these smaller kind of startups and designers and brands is a little bit tasteless it's a little bit kind of it feels like a little bit like corporate bullying right especially when you consider them trying to you know um, co-opt and get into the sneaker culture and get into streetwear and market stuff specifically to collectors you have to understand that the reason why this ecosystem system exists is because of those guys right they kind of start it you'd imagine they you know sneaker um what you call it um, sneaker designers especially or sneaker customizers the people that i despise they're usually the most corniest individuals in the world and they don't really have much creativity they could be it could be argued that they may be inspired um things like nike id right um by taking already conventional shoes and creating own bespoke colorways that nike weren't making or putting on the market because they were concentrating on appealing to the mass market until they realized that there was a billion dollar industry where you could basically market because think about it what is the population of people that collect sneakers like proper sneakers is it a million people maybe it's 500,000 it's not a lot of people right it's the same people buying the same shoes all the so same people buying the same shoes for the same brands again and again and again so Nike realized that if they just focus on concentrating marketing on just those select 500,000 people and they created a little mini economy they could make you know close to a billion i think it's from last time i checked the sneak industry was worth a billion especially the the kind of hype beastie type platform it's just insane amounts of money right because you're 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 making way more money 
marketing to a very niche group of people selling less numbers of quantity of items but also a high kind of retail price and obviously the the resale price is definitely affecting the allure and the appeal of the shoes and that's then kind of buying and that's kind of cycling back into the scene creating all these little upside brands people are starting t-shirt brands off the basis of a shoe remember back in the day with the diamond shoe diamond tiffany dunk you know diamonds co supply basically made their entire career off the back of that i'm pretty sure you know um, nick tershay would say he probably was able to buy his mansion and put his kids through private school off the back of that flipping shirt and that dunk so he's kind of created a whole little micro ecosystem and then when people kind of capitalize and get too big these guys get upset that they are not be able to take a cut and they come in and kill you so that's one side of things but the other side of things just has to be said those shoes are synonymous with nike right there's no other way to kind of separate an air force one shape without kind of including or talking about nike so for a brand an upside brand to take that shoe update it quote unquote add new materials which is you know essentially just taking off the swoosh and adding better materials isn't necessarily right right so you're, you're basically taking someone's intellectual property and making money off it without like, giving them a cut which definitely you cannot do so you shouldn't be complaining if anything it should be a lick it should be opportunity to make some money it should be opportunity to kind of garner some attention um get the eyes on you prove your worth you know do what what was that guy did mike sherman we did that kind of viral guerrilla campaign for nike i think it was jeff staple something and he got a job off the back of that you look at heron preston what he did with his collab with these kind of um street sweeper stuff that he did with the air force one mid with the gucci louis vuitton sort of um, motif on the swoosh use it as an opportunity even you know sammy ross at a cold war when he's spray painted and dip dyed um the air force ones that took off the laces added the kind of labels on them and then in the end he ended up collaborating on air force one himself use it a platform but don't kind of think you can build it as a don't think you can build your entire brand off the back of it Jeremy. You know I mean that's a little bit short-sighted you definitely have to think of the kind of exit strategy because sooner or later you're going to upset the wrong people and then you're going to kind of block some of your blessings and for sure somebody like a john guy like i said i'm not a fan of his shoes i think it's a little bit one-dimensional but still he's somebody that should have had a collaboration with nike already by this time and he hasn't because he probably upset the wrong people because of his you know um reluctance to change and evolve and move on to different things and maybe just use it as a platform and move on you went to build an entire career off the back of it and it's like you know you gotta chill you gotta jam maybe buy a, a couple of teslas off the off of that one shoe but don't go and try and put your kids and your kids kids through college off the back of it you have to relax so john geiger's reply to it was the following he said first and foremost i feel like nike has been taking inspiration and benefiting off the hard work from people i thought he was gonna say black people i was like mate i don't think you are even though you might marry be married to one i was like, oh okay cool uh <laughs> let's continue let's go again first and foremost i feel like nike has been taking inspiration and benefiting of the hard work you know, you know what i also thought he's gonna say i thought he's gonna say like marginalized people he's gonna say sneakers are like a marginalized community i was like huh um first and foremost i feel like nike has been taking inspiration and benefiting of the back of hard work for myself and a lot of other creators within the community over the past 10 years true but the game is a game they, they they even do that to their own designers have you seen those new jordan 4s that are about to come out they look similar to they basically look identical to the um off-white sale jordan 4s that Virgil done a few years ago or a couple of years ago that recently came out. i remember the women's pair they look exactly the same but everyone knows that's the game if you go and design a colorway for Nike or you retro a new model uh, or you retro an old model and bring it into the, you know, and kind of introduce it back into the market, there is an, there is a realization or an idea that most likely in a couple of years, they're going to take that exact model you did or colorway, tweak it a bit and then kind of dump it on the GRs, right? And dump it in the GR um, for the GR customers. It is the game. It is what it is. So if they do that to people that they pay, imagine people who they, they're not getting a cut of at all. It's just, you know, it is what it is. The game's a game. I've, made, I've remained quiet and have never spoken publicly because everyone within the senior community has spoken for me but now nike wants to use meritless claims and attack me as an entrepreneur yeah but you know you are kind of profiting off the back of their hard work let's let's, let's call it a spade a spade being a designer who's built my no mistake brand from the ground up and right away i've already built um for the ups and so i've already built for the ups and downs and all the hate and scrutiny that comes with it I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think you can... I, if you're a designer that's really worth your soul and you think you're a bad boy and you think you're up there and you think your voice is needed on, you know, when it comes to designing remote controls, bed frames, rugs, shoes and tables, you really should be trying to angle your way out of it. You really shouldn't just be trying to just do the one thing. It's a bit one note. It's a bit one dimensional. It's a bit limited. You should be trying to do other things. You should use the platform of the shoe to kind of allow you to kind of do other, you know, move into other avenues like that girl i forgot her name but who's that girl that repurposes you know carhartt stuff and nike bags and makes them into bikinis and all that malarkey it's a bit corny it's a little bit trite and a little bit you know 
basic bitch no, so it's a little bit you know it's a little bit um t- t- tiktok arts and crafts but you can clearly see it like it kind of was used as a platform as a kind of portfolio to show look here's what i can do i can actually build stuff i can actually make stuff with my hands i'm actually you know um competent in design whatever it may be and then you use that to kind of segue into other things but you can't just be sitting there remaking an air force one and expecting you're going to make an entire career for, for the rest of your life like you have to be a little bit insane um the entitlement is very strong. What, because you're a sneaker collector, you you buy shoes with your own money. It's like, congratulations, give you a pat on the back. It says, yeah, I'm preparing to fight this battle for all the creators and underdogs fighting the same uphill battle as me. Doesn't this guy have a, a mansion in the Hollywood Hills somewhere? I'm pretty sure he's one of those dudes. He's loaded, mate. He's made a really good, really good amount of money for himself. But to think that he's speaking for the underdogs and the people coming up is insane, mate. You've made a good killing off the back of this. Come on, relax. But he's nice, so I think he does like little seminars and classes and studios. He gets people to come in and, you know, cut Python leather and stick it onto a Jordan one and stuff, you know, that standard stuff. But let's call cool. yeah, let's let's relax. You my man, you're not Carl Lagerfeld, relax. He says, I've been very clear throughout the two years of developing and selling the GF01 that this silhouette was inspired by Nike and also made sure that anyone purchasing a shoe is aware of the design of the shoe and crafted the high materials and quality. Along with my trademark and changes to the silhouette, I also created my own mold for our outsoles with branded G JG trademark and changed the pattern multiple times, all while following trade dress guidelines i will be very vocal and open about what happens from here on out okay put out okay put the whole thing on his on his uh on his platform and stuff yeah you know the vibes he's just gonna com- keep complaining and crying about it because essentially they're taking away his ability to put food on his table and he's probably haven't thought of an exit plan which is definitely his fault but having said that it does make me think did nike ever come after um celine do you remember celine a few a few years ago when Phoebe Filo was there she designed a pretty impressive Air Force One copy basically a rip that looked like an Air Force One mid and if I'm not mistaken it was all kind of tonal um, no real branding on the yeah this is the one I wonder if Nike ever did come after Celine or come after um, Phoebe Filo Pacifica when the shoe was coming out because it doesn't look that undiscernible from an Air Force One mid obviously some of the paneling has, paneling has been changed I think that's if you're clever in terms of copyright infringement you can edit some things put stuff through Photoshop change the paneling how it's constructed the shape little tiny bits like I mentioned the Bape so I think when they made over 100 design changes to it in order to avoid a copyright infringement but I wonder what happened to Phoebe Filo and Celine when they put this together this air force one um esque mid i'm not sure what the actual shoe is called itself but this shoe is definitely super highly inspired by the um air force one and if you, and i think actually, i remember actually that shoe itself at 94 yeah when i used to work there the, the one on the left hand side even i've had that for sale i'm pretty sure but this definitely is very similar to a regular air force one mid you can't really discern it but of course she obviously updated it in her way to make it you know a little bit more um a little bit more kind of to fit in a little bit more to a woman's kind of wardrobe maybe it's a little bit more of a slimmer silhouette maybe the sole's a bit more comfortable maybe they're a little bit more durable than an air force one i'm not too sure i've never actually worn a pair myself of these shoes but i wonder what happened i wonder if it's just a thing where nike go after the young upstarts and make sure that they dissuade them by you know hitting them with the cease desist and then kind of you know have a quiet agreement with some of the higher luxury end brands or whether it's a thing that they apply this sort of treatment to everybody and everybody gets hit with cease and desist if you're trying to infringe on their copyright. I'm not really too sure. But regardless, I think John Geiger should stop crying and complaining. I think this day was always going to come. It was always on the books. You can't make an entire career and livelihood off the back of copying Air Force One's GF01. Come on, bruv. You didn't even bother taking the F and the 1 off of the flipping name. So you can't really blame them. And the shoe essentially looks identical to an Air Force One. Let's not, you know, let's not beat around the bush man it is it is it is what it is like we can't you know we can't get around from the facts that this shoe here where is it at the top if i can scroll back on this thing again if it's gonna go is it gonna go nope 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 yeah th- we can't deny that this shoe looks exactly like an air force one um it is what it is isn't it the the what you call it the show is finally coming to an end hopefully he pivots off into other things because again like i still said i'm not a fan of the shoes but i do think the dude's talented i think those first shoes that i saw with the many swooshes the black upper the black um 
um, high Air Force Ones were really well done. It clear that he does take a lot of pride in his craft. Um, I mentioned he sticks Python lever onto Jordan ones. It's not true. From what I saw, he does actually build the shoes from the ground up. Um, he takes panels and kind of recuts them into really expensive fabric, and you know makes it a, a bespoke shoe in that respect. So a lot of people like his work. Don't get me wrong, but you know let's relax on the um, original design or whatnot. It's taking inspiration from an already an already iconic shoe. Um, the day was going to come eventually, and it is what it is. Hopefully pits it into other things and he keeps his career rocking what else we got here top crypto no let's not go in that one we did that already by the bing by the boom what else we got here i want to talk about nope 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 i don't want this i don't want that i don't want this i don't want that yeah this is one interesting one so this is a look inside. This is courtesy of Hype. He says, "A look inside palaces, palace artois, pubs in New York and London." For me, off the back of what I've seen so far, this might be up there with one of the most corniest things I've seen in a long time. Up there with wearing, you know, collaboration merch from Lamborghini and whatnot. Right? It just doesn't. It's one of the things that I've kind of seen in modern day street at the moment that I just can't really reconcile with. I can't wrap my head around why this is something that people would want to wear. It just doesn't make any sense. I guess in terms of an experience to go to, fair enough. But wearing, you know, Stella Artois merch or merch, you know, adorning a luxury sports car. That you can't afford just doesn't really scream like a stable individual for all intents and purposes but again maybe i'm wrong article here says the following to mark the launch of their second collaboration with stella artois palace transformed venues in london new york into palace artois pubs the two spaces so her house is blue post and the vig bar in new york have featured special edition signage signatures and barware including beer mats and palace artois branded pint glasses Again, with this flipping, you know, working class cosplay stuff, it's just annoying, isn't it? These central London pubs that people rock up to in flipping $400 loafers and ADES track pants and a sovereign ring, it's just cringe as hell, isn't it? Like, ay ay ay. Honestly, if, I, if, if you were from those kind of areas and you were from a certain type of wealth bracket, why would you just embrace your affluent background? Why would you try to position yourself as some East Ender cockney lad when you're clearly not? You know what I mean? It just doesn't make any sense. It's even more cringe when they adapt this kind of faux Jamaican kind of rude boy aesthetic as well that they go on. I just, I just don't understand it. Like guys not from the ends, wanting to be from the ends whilst making millions of dollars selling, you know, branded skatewear and, you know, hoodies and stuff just doesn't really reconcile my brain but again maybe i'm not the one they're trying to appeal to it says you're opening a two-space celebrating the arrival blah, blah blah take a look through the two pubs gallery above august 27th is the last day for the step to our transformation on both blue post and vig bar so obviously it's gone by already but let's check the actual interior of it the merch and the collection of itself the clothing just looks garbage like a, i don't know for someone to wear like a you know a stella or a jumper regardless of what the brand is it just it just fills me with dread but anyway the outside of it obviously looks fairly well done signage looks very impressive they've obviously changed the layout and the interior of the pub itself i'm sure they had to pay a pretty decent amount to get that all done um, and basically turn it into a pop-up shop i guess because I'm, I'm sure you could probably purchase um the clothing behind the pub itself which might have been a pretty interesting experience right be able to get a pint and also rock up and get yourself a little jacket and a hoodie you got the typical shot there with the dog sat next to a beer probably wants to go home and chill watch a bit of tv and eat some dinner but you know it's got to be around strangers in a crowded pub somewhere with stinky carpets. It is what it is. You continue, nice signage. The logo on the little, uh, on the beer taps is really cool. Don't get me wrong. It looks really interesting here on the outside. It looks a little bit like an upscale Weatherspoons this cool image, right? With a little gold trim around the outside of it. Uh, but maybe that's just me. This is the one in New York, actually. Yeah, the New York one looks like an upscale Weatherspoons, isn't it? Um, we continue. Or like a really shitty sort of... Um, you know after hours brothel in some sort of movie with the glasses and stuff around it again i just don't i don't get it i don't get it there, there, there probably is nothing more lame than sitting on a train somewhere on the way to go to a boiler room show again boiler room is lame as it is already it's probably gone by it's, it's the days of it being the place to go is probably passed but imagine being a kid that you know you got your little side patch your little um satchel on your front you got a stella or top had a beer can sat on a train somewhere listening to the heavy beats of some no name and some you know, no mark nts person rocking up to a boiler room to go and you know stick up your gum fingers and all that malarkey it's just uh, i don't know i don't get it and then the clothes itself have i got it here somewhere yep this is the clothes 
aren't especially interesting themselves. Come on, man. Who's rocking a hoodie with a flipping beer bottle on the back of it? It's just, I don't know. Maybe it's just me and I just don't get this stuff. But come on, man. A beer glass on the back of your jumper, on your hoodie. That just looks like not nothing. Like maybe the hat is something good. That's like a good little bit of merch that you might want to get, right? But a hoodie, a, a, a flipping varsity jacket with Stella on the back. It's like, God damn it. Obviously for Stella Artois, it's amazing because they get the chance to, you know, separate their brand from wife beaters and, you know, people essentially living on a dole, running away from their families and, you know, um, participating in some illegal activity in the back of a river spoons and they get to align it more with a multicultural, young, hip, dynamic, you know, client base. But, I don't know. There, there's nothing young hip about this at all. This is good. like imagine if somebody did some merch with K Sider, how lame that would be, right? Or Red Stripe or something. And it's like th this is that it's that shitty beard that you get given at an art gallery somewhere, but it's not something that you're gonna plaster over your clothes and wear it pride. It just looks a little bit lame. Again, I don't know. I don't know. And maybe there's something about promoting drinking this amount of beer to young people that doesn't necessarily seem like the thing that you want to promote either. But you know. I'm not going to be the judge of that kind of stuff because I don't, you know, uh, pretend to be sober myself. But still, it's something that I probably wouldn't want to be pushing too far. But I don't know. I think it's a bit lame. But, you know, people seem to be into it. And maybe it's a far more interesting way to do a collaboration than doing this terrorist stereotypical stuff. But there's something about wearing, you know, Stella Artois merch, Lamborghini merch, Range Rover merch, Mercedes merch. It just looks a bit strange, like especially if you don't drive one. Like, why have you got that? Why have you got a Ferrari hat? It's just, that's nothing I've, I've, I've never got that. Unless you're getting, you're a fan of F1 and you're wearing Pacific F1 merch, it's completely different. Still a bit lame, but different. So it's like playing, it's like being a fan of golf and not playing the game. It just doesn't make any sense, isn't it? You have to at least race some kit cars or whatever on the weekend or go down a little strip somewhere in some no mark street and, you know, push your little hatchback to the limits. That's fairly cool. But just wearing this stuff in the hopes that what people think, like, I don't know, like, who's meant to be wearing this? Just people that drink. If you don't drink, you it's probably a little bit of a, you know, it's probably, it's probably more of a incongruent thing to be working, wearing stuff like this. I don't know. I don't know. It just seems a little bit lame. But again, maybe I'm not the target demographic. I'm definitely not in the age range for it. That's for sure. But I don't know. There's, there are far better things I'd want to, you know, I think I've got, I might have a, I've got one of these actually. Yeah, I've got a Paps Blue Ribbon tea that hat, sorry, trucker hat that I got back in the day. That's fairly lame, but it, again, it's ironically lame. It's banged up as what well a shit. So I think the hat itself could go really well, but just having a whole line of merch that you're wearing and wearing a Passport Ribbon coach jacket and a hoodie and a t-shirt is just like, get a life. I mean, get some hobbies, get a girlfriend or something. I don't know. Those things will probably be uh, things that I would think of first before donning such a thing. But again, maybe I am wrong. Anyway, that is... The Agassi Zing Show, episode number 489. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. It's been an interesting show. Hopefully, you felt that and you felt the vibes. If it's the first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast, I have a five-star review. will help the show to go a long way. And of course, subscribe to the Patreon. The link is available in the description. Don't delay. Get involved in there today. And hopefully, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Until then, take care and be safe. Peace. Peace.